thanks very much for that kind introduction. I'm not a thought leader in pig immunology. So. I, I, I do dabble in genomics, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so this is a talk that uh, Jack and I put together um, um, based on thinking about how we might be able to uh, talk to this group about some of the genomic tools that are going on in, 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 the, in the genomic area. So, uh, so the, the talk will be um, really developing some resources and tools, and I, and I want to talk first about uh, some of the genetic approaches, GWAS um, approaches to look at response uh, to PERS infection. Um, the outcomes, just briefly, the outcomes of using some of these tools, because I think that this has been discussed in this group in, in the past five or so years. Um, but then also how to improve these approaches with new genomic um, uh, information. And specifically, I want to um, emphasize some of the new uh, work that we're doing on functional annotation in terms of the FANG project. Um, and then the current uh, uh, USDA FANG projects. Okay. So a little bit about GWAS, because I know this is not a, a, strong, uh, a strongly genetic group, much more of an immunology group. Uh, the purpose of GWAS is to um, try to uh, identify the regions of the genome that harbor variation that might control superior responses to infection. So we're interested in a genetic approach. And if, and if regions can be identified that control heritable differences in response, then those could be used to select for improved responses. So just in a little bit of an aside on GWAS and um, to, to describe it a little bit more, uh, if you don't uh, know the variant that's causing a superior response, a genetic variant, how can you assay for it? And so I'll just give a little bit of a background on that. So. Um, if we have tools that follow each portion of the genome independently uh, through a genotyping approach, we can find variable regions um, that present primarily in animals with superior traits. Uh, and the, the idea is, is, is shown in the figure on the side. If we think about uh, an important variant that might improve our responses um, as, a, as a new mutant in, a, in an animal, uh, what we have around that mu mutation is, is other DNA variants. And in that founder animal, those DNA variants are, are very close to that, to that mutation. Over time, the, the variants are, um, are, are going to be uh, segregated away uh, through recombination, but the variants that are very close to that important causative variant will, will maintain that linkage. And so that's the, the basic idea that we're working from. Is it, and this is called linkage disequilibrium. The, essentially, these markers are so close that they remain linked uh, to the variant of interest over time. And so that allows us to find uh, variants that we don't have an assay for and we don't even know what they do. So what's needed for GWAS studies? Uh, essentially, we need the phenotypes, and that's where we rely on you to, to help collect those responses to PERS. Um, but also genome-wide genotyping tools. And they need to be accurate, cheap, and, and quite easy to use. And there are several methods that people have used over time to create such tools, but I'll emphasize the one that, that I've been working on and, and others uh, in the genome field, is first create a genome assembly to try to map the variants that you've obtained from sequencing genomes um, from different pigs um, with, with different uh, genetic backgrounds. Once you've decide, uh, designed and, and, and created an assembly of the genome, then you can design high coverage genotyping tools by, by using those variants and, and identifying a selected set of markers across the genome that are evenly spaced. And that even spacing is important uh, to try to take advantage of the, that linkage disequilibrium, to try to find trait variants um, that are associated with these variable markers um, that you can genotype. And there's a couple of genotyping tools that I'll talk about. There are a number of others, um, especially more recently, but, but the main ones that have been used a lot in, in, in genetics, and especially in PERS, um, is, the, is the Illumina SNP60 chip, which means uh, about 60,000 variants across the genome. That sounds like a lot, but there's more recently been one that's, that's um, multiplied that by tenfold. Um, uh, there's a lot of data on the SNP60 chip, not, not quite as much um, in the more recent chip. 
But both of them have been designed from um, uh, the, the, the previous genome uh, assemblies. Uh, and uh, they, they, again, the design is to, to take the variants, um, map them uh, evenly across the genome, and so that allows us to cover the, the genome as much as possible. So I just want to talk about um, a, a summary of, of how those were used in the, in the past, and, and as I said, I'll go through this very quickly because I think Jack has talked about this kind of work um, in the past here. Um, essentially, this is uh, work done between Jack and, and Bob Rowland at K-State where the idea is to take large numbers of pigs that were infected with, with the same PERS virus um, isolate uh, and, and collect data over a 42-day period, essentially collecting phenotypes, weights, and, um, and also serum uh, for viremia. Uh, and then we're genotyping all of these animals to try to find uh, those uh, places in the genome that are different uh, for the different, or, or, or linked to the, the phenotypes of interest. And, uh, the, the, of course, the big discovery out of those projects was that there was a virus um, load um, uh, associated uh, variation on chromosome 4 um, that was also um, uh, had an effect on weight gain. And so this was a very important discovery in an important region that explained uh, quite a bit of the genetic variance. Fifteen percent of the genetic variance is a very large effect in, 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 the, in the genetic circles. And um, where I want to talk about uh, uh, what we can do in the future on this is, is really the, the next step, um, in, including um, uh, the, the genes that were in that region. And so, of course, the next step is we have a region, we can follow it, and the readers can use that, but we're really interested in knowing exactly what's going on. And it turned out that this was a one megabase region that um, essentially was one of these blocks of linkage disequilibrium. In other words, these, these, um, all these variation uh, variants in this region had very little recombination that broke them apart in different animals. So it was just one big block. And um, what, what the problem is is population genetics can't distinguish which one is causing the effect because they segregate all together. So how do we try to find which one is actually the causative variant? And one thing we can do is try to understand how these genes are expressed um, in, in different animals uh, during infection and try to understand the function of those genes and try to figure out which one is the most important one. And so we did an RNA sequencing experiment um, comparing those two, the two phenotypes that um, were different for this particular marker. Um, and we looked at RNA in blood over uh, 14 days of infection to try to see if we could understand the differences. And what we found is focusing on the genes that were expressed in that one megabase region, uh, uh, we found that there was one gene, GBP5, that had uh, a difference in expression over time uh, after infection between the two genotypes. So that became a very strong candidate gene. It was in the right region, and it was differentially responding uh, to infection depending on the genotype in that region. And further work um, in the laboratory uh, identified um, by sequencing animals, identified that there was a, a variant that actually could explain that gene, is, that gene expression differences. And so this variant um, uh, changed the, the splicing of the RNA, and uh, through additional work we were able to validate that. And we think that we now have a very strong candidate gene, and this has been published. So that was an example of, of how to use the genotyping tools to perhaps drill all the way down to, um, uh, to the actual causative gene. But uh, thinking about the, uh, the other um, potential uses and, and, and improvements, if we think about what if variants on the chip are not in sufficient linkage disequilibrium to find the associated region, we may need to think about improving the system. And usually that means either the region or the gene may be missing from the assembly. Uh, the assemblies are not perfect, and the tools are not perfect, and, and so there are approaches that you can do to try to um, get around those problems. And the first one is an example that um, Jack and his group has, have been using in terms of a, a, a candidate gene approach to try to find additional variation that they can follow beyond the chips that are available. And the example is sort of the famous CD163, uh, which has been um, published a, a few years ago. Oops. Uh, and, and shown that if you knock out CD163, the receptor for the PERS virus, those pigs are completely resistant to, to infection by the virus. 
Um, what, was, what was of interest is to think about what um, uh, existing genetic variation was present at this gene instead of creating new variation uh, by gene editing. And this was uh, instigated or, or, or um, inspired by uh, some previous work that identified with a small group of animals that there was a, uh, a variant in CD163 that showed a difference um, with PERS infection. But uh, the, the, the data uh, that, that Jack had with, with Bob on this very large study, uh, we, the, the, the intent was to try to see if that, was, um, uh, uh, that data could be used. And the problem was the CD163 is not in the, in the SNP60 chip. And there's only one SNP out of many uh, in 163 on, the, on the, the more recent chip, the very large 660K chip. So what they decided to do was identify all CD163 um, uh, genotypes and, and variants that were present in the literature and, and then did a, an additional genotyping specifically for, for those variants. And they used the same data, uh, same phenotypic data on viral load and weight gain um, and then analyzed uh, these, these individual SNPs for their role or their association with those phenotypes. And interestingly enough, the, they were able to find uh, association of SNPs in 163 uh, with uh, PERS viral load. And depending on which uh, variant you're talking about, um, there was uh, either, either extremely high association or, 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 or a suggestive association. So this is an example of the ability to, to find new variation um, in, uh, beyond uh, these, these very presumably comprehensive SNP chips. There wasn't any effect on weight gain uh, for any of the SNPs in um, CD163, um, but the, the conclusion really is that these newly identified and, and, and assayed for um, SNPs in 163 can serve as genetic markers in addition to the, to the ones that have been identified to look for uh, natural resistance to, to PERS. And obviously this could be something that we could add to the next SNP genotyping chip. So that's one approach to uh, try to add to, to the, the SNP genotyping that's available. Uh, the other is a more general approach, and that's perhaps one I'm more interested in. Um, instead of sort of um, running down every interesting candidate gene, that maybe the better idea is to improve the genome assembly to begin with, and then create better tools. And we do have an improved pig genome assembly. Um, it's um, uh, uh, build 11.1. Uh, uh, the old build was 10.2, which has been out for about uh, eight years now, but the 11.1 but the was, was uh, put out into the literature um, in, in terms of bioarchive last year, and, and the, the sequence has been available for about a year and a half. The biggest improvement, or the, the primary improvement, is, is about a 90-fold increase in contiguity. And what I mean by that is, is essentially almost all of the genes that are neighboring each other are together on a contig. They're, they're together actually on a DNA sequence that you can see in the, in the, in the computer. The previous uh, assembly, uh, we, we had very good completeness, but most neighboring genes were on separate contigs. We had a lot of gaps in the actual sequence, sort of a dirty little secret in the genome assembly. It wasn't really assembled. Now this gives you a good example. It's a little hard to see it perhaps, but the, but the black and gray bars are showing alternate contigs. So every time you change a color, you change and, and you have, there's a gap in the, in, the, in the assembly. And so this was the original assembly. Um, this is the current assembly. And so you can see that there's huge swaths of chromosomes that are contiguous. A, a single DNA sequence is available. Even for some chromosomes, we, we basically have an, an entire assembled chromosome. We still have about 500 gaps, which sounds like an enormous number. Um, but if, if you look at the best human genome at the moment, we're actually better than the, the, the human genome in terms of gaps uh, with some of the newer technology. Probably more importantly is that um, with this contiguity uh, improvement, we've also been able to find more genes because they're, they're present in their correct sequence and they don't have gaps or missing pieces. So we've added about 20% uh, more genes. So the SNP chips can, can now be further improved. Um, we'll have better spacing, and we'll clearly we'll be able to include more genes. And I wanted to emphasize um, that 
The, the, the assembly itself is not just good for SNP chips and, and for GWAS and genetics, but it's also a basis for, for more accurate use of genomic tools like transcriptomics for immunity, nutrition, reproduction, physiology, etc. So, so I would encourage you to, to use the new assembly. Um, so finally in this area, I wanted to also discuss what if you have many SNPs that are associated with a trait variation. So, so for example, in PERS, they, we were fortunate enough to have one very large effect, even though there were um, a number of SNPs in that region, and we were able to, to drill down to uh, GBP5. It may work to, to select a SNP just within an LD region, um, but there will be discussion tomorrow by Ryan Jian about where sometimes that SNP is not always in LD in all populations. But, and you could also do what we did with GBP5, but that's extremely time consuming and it's very costly. Um, it involves a large amount of experimental work. And so we need a more comprehensive means to try to filter SNPs to find the ones that are relevant to the trait. And, and what, what are the methods that we can use to try to figure out which SNPs are important? Uh, this is just a little cartoon to describe um, the, what, what I'm thinking, what we're thinking about in the field. If you think about a, a genome where you have a couple of, uh, of different genes in it um, that are identified, and maybe you have a bunch of SNPs across this region that are all associated with controlling PERS um, titer, how do you try to figure out which one's important? Well, this one's in a gene, so maybe that's the most important one. I mean, genes are what um, are, are, are an important component of our responses. But on the other hand, um, you might also in, in, uh, be interested in the regulatory sequences, and there might be a regulatory sequence that that's, turns genes on in macrophage cells, which could be quite relevant to PERS, and so maybe this SNP is, more, is the more important one. Maybe more important, especially since this gene is ex only expressed in the mammary gland if we had that information. So that may, may mean that this SNP is much more important. But on the other hand, there are also other regulatory uh, sequences that we don't even know what, whether their uh, function is. They may be controlling that gene or that gene, we don't know. And so in, in fact, it may actually be this SNP that's more important. So the, the regulation is potentially important. Um, and is there evidence that gene regulatory regions actually contain important genetic information? And, and uh, I wouldn't be telling you this if there weren't, uh, of course. So there is good evidence um, in, in the human literature that trait-associated genetic variation is enriched in genes, and that's, that's pretty obvious. You'd expect that, that GWAS SNPs um, that are in genes to be associated or significantly enriched um, uh, for uh, uh, if they're in protein coding regions. And that's, that's relative to, to SNPs that are just in intergenic regions. But what's interesting is that there's also an enrichment of SNPs that are associated with traits that are in regions that are flanking or outside known coding regions. So, so if you look at the, the, the um, transcriptional start site or nearby, they're, they're almost as, as highly enriched in those regions as they are in coding sequences. And this has been shown in livestock as well, out of some work out of Australia in cattle. Um, what they found was when they mapped human regulatory sequences to the, to the bovine genome and then looked to see um, where SNPs that were associated with um, traits like fat yield, milk yield, or protein yield, where are those um, uh, uh, SNPs, they found that they were highly enriched in regulatory sequences, much more than they found if in a random sampling. So again, this is information that tells us that regulation is important and, and will contain a lot of variation that's of interest to us. So if we, if we think about how we can uh, use that kind of an idea in genomics, if we had a detailed map of where all the functional elements are in the pig genome, we could then filter um, any associated SNPs and focus on the most relevant SNPs for genetic improvement, for example, for PERS res resistance. And this has been uh, worked on in the human field. Uh, it's called en the ENCODE project. Um, uh, a lot of the, the work of the ENCODE project uh, came out a few years ago. And the basic idea is how do we find the regulatory regions in the genome? And the, 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 the two things that are important are what part of the genome is expressed. And so we look at RNA levels and, and where the RNAs are in, in, in the genome. 
but we also are interested in what part controls that expression, the regulatory parts. And, the, and I won't have time to talk about all the different assays for that, but, but essentially what we're looking at is what regions are open for business and, and are, are there to, to, uh, to allow regulation and expression of genes, and what parts are completely closed off and are not turned on in a particular tissue. And essentially what the Human ENCODE project did was collected all these samples, all these data on, on a number of, of samples, many different kinds of samples, um, but collected them all, all in the same uh, in individual samples, and that allowed a predictive model for genome function. So all these different assays can point to a particular um, function in, a, in the genome, for example, the, the, the promoter for this gene, and so these, all these different assays predict that. And it allows us to predict the chromatin state, whether it's open or whether it's closed. And, and, and then further, take that all the way across the genome and create a functional map um, of the genome segments. And uh, this is a $150 million project, which I'm summarizing in one slide here. Um, but essentially what they were able to do is link chromatin state or, or the, the predicted function of the, of the chromatin region to phenotype through um, uh, looking at the SNPs. So they found that there, there was an effect on chromatin elements uh, linked to trait-associated SNPs and that those SNPs were enriched in tissues that were directly relevant to those traits. So, so different, different diseases are shown here, like autoimmune, um, um, uh, different uh, neurological di issues or, or metabolic issues, and they found that the SNPs were in regions that were specifically um, functional or active in tissues that were relevant. So for example, sorry. So for example, for autoimmune diseases, you found um, these elements were, were found in regions that were active in, in T cells. So the idea is to, if you have trait-associated SNPs, you can look, the human geneticist can look in the ENCODE data for the function of the region around those SNPs, and then you can filter the SNPs based on, on those functions to identify the best candidates for causality. And so the idea is that we can now apply that in, in the livestock species as well. And, and I'm one of the organizers of a, a project called the FANG project, or the Functional Annotation of Animal Genomes. Um, Who's, which has been growing for, for a number of years. We started about five years ago, and we have over 400 com contributors to the project. Um, and the main emphasis of this project is that ENCODE's success, was a, it was a very large project. Um, it required a high-quality ge reference genome, which we now have. But more importantly, it required a lot of common infrastructure and sharing. So, so biological resources, bioinformatic tools, databases were all shared uh, among the groups. And importantly, there was an effective need for communication and, and communication. So we need all those as well to succeed. Um, essentially, we have a number of current activities in FANG. I won't go through them all, but we have committees that are looking at collecting the samples and sharing um, the metadata on those samples. We're analyzing and, and creating bioinformatic tools and, and communication. And then uh, Elisabetta Gioffra and myself, we, we chair the steering committee. Essentially, we're trying to globally coordinate functional annotation across all the, the domesticated animal species. And since we don't have the money of the human field, we need to do this very efficiently, and, 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 but we're also interested in comparative work. So this is the, essentially the basic idea of FANG. We have a number of early projects, um, and, I, and, and they're shown here. Uh, most of these are already underway, or even some of them are completed or nearing completion. I'll just briefly mention the USDA um, early um, uh, pilot project uh, at the UC Davis, where they were interested in, in um, looking at chicken, pig, and cattle, and doing the same assays uh, across all three of those species. This is a project run by Hua Zhen Zhou, um, at UC Davis, and um, essentially you can see sort of the, the, the progress of their, their project. What their main goal is to look at eight adult tissues and look for all the genes expressed in those tissues, all the different chromatin states across um, all tissues. And it's nearly complete for, for many of the assays. Uh, so that's an example of projects in phase one of FANG, where the emphasis is on establishing reference data sets on, on gene expression and regulatory elements uh, for um, healthy adults, healthy adult tissues. We have few replicates, biological replicates, and no treatments just because we were setting a, a healthy animal baseline. And again, doing things like metadata toolboxes and so forth. 
But the next phase is, is perhaps maybe a little bit more relevant to, to this group. The phase two would be to begin to expand biological states. Um, so infection and other treatments, maybe developmental states or genetic variation. And so I'm heading up a project that was just funded last year. It's one of the main resource projects for FANG, and it's called Functional Annotation of the Pig Genome. The overall goal is to catalog functional elements in the, big, uh, the, pig gene, uh, the porcine genome for many different biological states. The more biological states we have, the more specific we can be about the function of a region in the genome. And so we're extending the pilot project of Dr. Zo from 8 to 25 tissues for adults. We're also looking at fetal tissues, and obviously for this group, we're doing a, a, quite a detailed study of the immune system where, where we're sorting circulating blood cells into um, nine different functional types and then doing extensive RNA and biochemical assays for chromatin function and, and expression um, in those uh, circulating blood cells. We're also doing some stimulations of macrophages and PBMCs to look at, at broad responses um, to those um, uh, effects. And um, I think an exciting aspect is we're beginning to establish the, the use of single cell analysis for blood PBMCs and, and immune tissues. And then, of course, the last aim is to integrate the data. Uh, who, the people involved um, are UC Davis, who are continuing the adult um, uh, tissue work. Um, people at um, USDA Mark, uh, Dan Nonneman and Tim Smith, who are interested in fetal gene expression. Um, Kathy, St uh, um, Kathy Ernst and, and J.P. Steibel um, uh, and Wei Huang at Michigan State, who are doing all the DNA methylation work, which I didn't talk about. And then um, in Iowa, Crystal Loving, which you're, you're quite familiar with, um, uh, here uh, is, is doing uh, most of the immunology work and immune, immune tissue analysis, and then we're uh, working on a lot of the bioinformatics and, and data analysis. And just to wrap up, we have um, essentially um, some deliverables of, of looking at transcriptome and epigenetic information on about 40 biological states. Um, and then I guess, uh, 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 of course, the, the idea is to predict the function of all these different uh, genomic regions so that we can prioritize SNPs um, and, and provide this resource for, for anyone working in any, um, any of the fields that, uh, that would be interesting to, uh, of interest in pigs. So just a little bit of a conclusions and outlook um, for FANG. Um, there's about $40 million now um, uh, been awarded for FANG projects worldwide, about $7.5 million fr uh, from the three USDA projects that were funded last year. In addition, there's about another $2 million funded for smaller projects in, in other, another of other species, for example, in, in sheep and, and horse. Uh, about $20 million was funded just this year and, and, or started this year um, on three different projects in the European Commission, and, and there's fairly substantial projects in Australia and in Canada as well. I think um, sort of a, a, a prediction, the next five to ten years we'll see an explosion of this kinds of functional data, cattle, pig, chicken, sheep, and horse, um, as well as aquaculture. And I, I feel like the, the main long-term goal for this is, is to try to realize a predictive biology, so to try to increase usefulness um, of that genomic information and our genetic information for society and industry. Specifically for the breeding industry, which I'm most closely aligned with, is again this idea of filtering SNPs um, with traits and potentially um, related to PERS response as an example. And this was a very large project, both from the, the PERS Host Genetics Consortium project, um, which I talked about very briefly, um, but, but both um, Iowa State and, and K-State were, were main players in that, as well as many other groups that are involved in the P PHGC. Uh, Joan Lenny is here from um, ARS as well. And we also had uh, groups outside the U.S. Um, that also participated in various aspects of the, of the PERS projects. And we had funding and industry partners as well. Uh, in, in terms of the FANG project, uh, there's a number of groups involved, and I, it's hard to, to talk about all of them, but uh, essentially we've had a lot of funding from NIFA, um, uh, and, and some of the early projects uh, were funded by INRA and, and many, many other projects as well. So just to, to, to finish, I would say if you're interested in FANG, please um, uh, uh, join FANG, and, and you can get quite a bit of information. There's, there's a website where you can get previous talks, and you can find out what all the projects are doing. So we're trying to be as open as we can. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks.
Questions for Dr. Toggle? Nice talk. Uh, maybe I have a question. When you said that it will be difficult to uh, uh, find or, or an indication which SNP are important or which are not, which are not. So uh, maybe in one indication could be just uh, evaluating the ratio of neutral versus purifying selection. Uh, from that point of view, maybe this could indicate which SNPs are important. So, for what, what was the neutralizing what? Versus purifying uh, selection. Oh, sure. Y yes, absolutely. And, and both coding sequences and regulatory sequences can have some um, sequence constraints, some, some uh, functional constraint. And so there's, there's definitely some advantage to, to, to applying those approaches. Uh, it's probably most fruitful in the coding sequencing area and, and, and in, the, in the RNA expressing area. But um, what actually has been found in the human field, which has the most data, is most of the associated SNPs are, are actually in, in less well-conserved regulatory regions. So that's one of our problems. We don't have a strong um, uh, evolutionary constraint on those elements. Any more questions? I, I, just have, I just have one. Uh, when looking at the relationship between the genome and response uh, to infectious disease, what about response to vaccination in terms of finding the genetics of uh, protection following vaccination? Yeah, I think that's a, a really good idea. Um, I think one thing that I'm quite interested in is, is potentially looking at even within cells and, and thinking about what, what Toby was talking about. Can you, can you drill down to the single cells and see which cells are responding to vaccines and which cells are responding better to, to different vaccines? I think that could be really interesting in addition. But certainly the genetic control of vaccine response would, is, is of, of strong interest. Okay, if no more questions, we'll move on to next talk. Thanks, Dr. Parker.